So in this next subsection, we'll consider numerical integration methods. Well, we know that the relation between the Z domain and the Laplace domain is the following relation. And what we'll do here is approximate this relation and this will yield a relation between Z and S, an approximate relation. And this will allow us to obtain an approximation of a transfer function in S. To do that, let us consider an integral system. Okay, this is indeed a signal, a system, sorry, that integrates the input signal. Remember that you can see this as follows. And if we take the inverse Laplace transform, this is what you obtain. We integrate to obtain Y and here it's crystal clear that the output can be written as the integral of the input. So in discrete time, what do we do? We replace T by K T S, right? So we have K T S here and we would like to write this as a recursive equation. So this is the output of the integrator at time KTS and we would like to write it as the output at the previous sampling instant. So it's an integral from minus infinity to K minus one TS, right? And then we have to add a term to make sure that this corresponds to what you have over here. Okay, so this is kind of the correction term. So the output of the integrator at sample k is the output of the integrator at sample k minus 1 and you have to add the area under the curve in between k minus 1 and k. Okay, so here I have used the indices k and k minus 1. If you work with times, you have to use kts and k minus 1 ts. So with discrete notations, the output of the integrator at index k is the output of the integrator at index k minus 1 plus a correction, which is the area under the curve in between indices k minus 1 and k. So it's the area under the curve in between times k minus 1 ts and k ts. And this area can be approximated using many numerical rules and we'll consider four of them. Backward rectangular, forward rectangular, trapezoidal and pre-warped trapezoidal. The most important ones are the ones the three first ones and these two methods are the so-called Euler integration methods. So we'll start with the Euler backward difference method. Remember that the equation that we're using is the following one. So the output of the integrator at index k, right, is the output of the integrator at index k minus 1 plus a correction. So the output of the integrator at index k minus 1 will kind of approximates this surface over here. Etc. So what we have to add is what is shown here in blue. It's an approximation of this area. So what we'll do is approximate it by the area of a rectangle that is shown here in gray, right? And it's quite easy to obtain the area of this rectangle since it has a base of TS and the height here is simply X of K. So this is the area or an approximation of the area in blue it's precisely the area that is here in gray right so 
this is the description in discrete time so what we can do is go to the z domain right if we take the z transform of this equation neglecting initial conditions this is what we obtain right and now we can have a look at the transfer function y between y and x so we'll have if we this one goes on the other side 1 minus z minus 1 y of z is equal to ts x of z so this is what you obtain this is in terms of the variable z minus 1 but you can also write it in terms of the variable z so this is a description of my integrator in discrete time using the Euler backward difference. In English we say that the value of xk is projected back. Okay. In French we call this the method, la méthode des rectangles à droite. So it's the value that is to the right that is used. So the idea is now that we compare this discrete time integrator obtained using the Euler backward difference method to the continuous time description of the integrator. So we equate this transfer function in S with this transfer function in Z and this gives you the approximation rule that you can use, right? If you take your transfer function and you replace s by z minus 1 over z t s, then you obtain an approximate discrete time description according to this Euler backward difference rule. So this is s as a function of z. You can very easily see that. Right? So we'll have z is sts minus 1 is equal to minus 1. So z is indeed 1 over 1 minus ts s. This is what we have over here. And again, if you remember that exponential of x is approximately 1 plus x when x is small you can see that this is 1 over the exponential of minus tss so the exponential of tss so this euler backward difference well numerical integration method indeed approximate the relation z is the exponential of tss as you can see so this is the relation between S and Z that we had obtained using this backward Euler difference method. And we will see that it maps the J omega axis, you've got it over here, on a circle centered in Z is equal to a half and with a radius a half. So you can see that a transfer function with poles that are all stable will be transformed in a transfer function where the poles are located in this circle over here. So they will remain stable in the z domain using this Euler backward difference method. But you can see also that some unstable systems in the s domain might become stable in the z domain because a pole to the right might be transformed in a pole that is inside the unit circle so this is the relation that we had obtained right and the question was is this relation going to map the j omega axis into a circle that is centered in z is equal to a half and that has a radius of a half. So what we do, we substitute s is equal to j omega in the relation. This is what you obtain. You multiply numerator and denominator by the complex conjugate. 
okay this allows you to write things like this j square is minus one so here you have a description of z now where you can kind of decompose in real part and imaginary part the real part is given over here the imaginary part is given over here so what you have to check now is that the real part minus a half squared plus the imaginary part squared is equal to the radius squared so the radius squared is 1 over 4 and we have a question over here we have to prove this so what we do is replace the real part of z by its value over here but you have minus a half okay so we put it under the same denominator so we'll have this expression here squared and this is simply the imaginary part squared so we put everything under the same denominator you can see that it is the same denominator we have a square over here this is the denominator and we put one quarter because one minus a half is a half here we have a half there a half to the power two so a quarter we can put it up front but then we have to put a four over here because there is no quarter over here so, so this is exactly the same thing so we can now compute this quantity over here and to the power two this is what you obtain this one will cancel out with this one and we'll have a two so and the, on the numerator we'll have exactly the same thing um, as what you see here on the denominator so indeed this is equal to a quarter okay so indeed this relation here maps the j omega axis into a circle that is centered in z is equal to a half and that has a radius of a half so let us try this method on our first order system with static gain one we use this euler backward difference approximation so this means we inject this expression in the transfer function and you obtain the discrete time transfer function according to this well Euler backward difference numerical integration methods and of course you can rewrite this and this is the transfer function that you obtain right you can see that the pole is located in 1 over 1 plus ATS again we use exponential is approximately 1 plus x when x is small so this looks like an exponential and so we have a an approximation that is the exponential of minus a t s here the continuous time pole is equal to minus a right this is the discrete time pole and you can see here that if ts is sufficiently small well then this discrete time pole will actually be related to this pole over here by the relation z is equal to ts s which is the relation that links the z domain to the s domain but here since we're using a numerical integration method this is only true when ts is small well it is nice to be able to find this transfer function but it's also a very good idea to be able to rewrite this in the form of a recursive equation so how do we do this so this is yz over xz so you have really yz times this one over here so it's 1 plus a t s z minus 1 is equal to a t s z x s x of z sorry so we can write y of z times z over here the z so 
as we'll keep it over here for the moment right is equal to yz plus a t s z x of z so z y of z is equal to 1 over 1 plus a t s y of z plus a t s over 1 plus a t s z x of z and what we can now do is take the inverse z transform okay so what we will have is y k plus 1 is 1 over 1 plus a t s y of k plus a t s over 1 plus a t s x k plus 1 okay so here y k plus 1 is directly related to x k plus 1 so there is kind of a direct feed through term so there is no delay in the system in this particular case we can now present the Euler forward difference method the IDs are very similar as you will notice so this is the output of the integrator at sample k it's the integrator at the previous sample k minus 1 plus a correction term and what you should add is the area here in blue okay and this area in blue will be approximated right? so it's this area over here by the rectangle that is given in gray okay so this time the area is approximated by well ts the base and the height is xk minus one okay so what we do is kind of project forward and the value of xk minus one but we project it forward to the next sample this is why in french this is called la méthode des rectangles à gauche we use the left value x of k minus one okay so when we compare with the Euler forward difference we had the same equation but instead of xk minus one we had xk over here and when we go to the z domain we'll have the same equation except that we'll have a z minus one over here and this z minus one will appear over here right this is the transfer function when you work in z minus one and when we try work in the variable z we multiply by z on numerator denominator this is what you obtain right well using this Euler forward difference approximation method we have obtained an approximation of the continuous time integrator and the approximation that we have obtained is given over here so the idea will be to equate those two equations and to find a relation between s and c okay this is the relation that you obtain the idea is again to take your transfer function in s and replace s by z minus 1 over ts and you obtain a discrete time approximation of your original transfer function right using this Euler forward method if you write z as a function of s uh, here s is written as a function of z it's very easy to see that z is 1 plus tss again exponential of x is approximately 1 plus x when x is small so this is really approximating the relation that you have between the variable z and the variable s but it's approximating this is why you call this a numerical integration or numerical approximation method well there is an intuition behind this formula over here in the laplace domain if you do s y s well in the time domain you're taking the derivative okay so 
if you do this thing here you expect also to be taking a derivative but in the z domain and this is indeed the case if you take the inverse z transform you'll have yk plus 1 minus yk divided by ts so y of t plus ts minus yt divided by ts and this is closely related not the same thing as yt minus yt minus ts over ts when you compute the slope of a curve in discrete time this is the type of formula that you're using so this kind of makes sense well using this Euler forward difference method we had used the following relation between the z domain and the s domain it's an approximation of the actual relation and it you will see that it will map the j omega axis this one over here on a vertical line this one over here it continues located in z is equal to one right so everything that is to the left of the j omega axis in the laplace domain will be mapped to the left of this vertical line z is equal to one in the z domain and as a consequence you can see that some stable s domain systems become unstable in the z domain if you use this numerical integration method okay well even if the problems are kind of small if ts is chosen sufficiently small this is a method that is not recommended so if you have to use an euler method use the euler backward difference method but the best thing to do is of course to use the method that we'll present next which is the trapezoidal method for numerical integration so we can apply this euler forward difference method on our system first order with static gain one we replace s by this function of z and this is really the euler forward difference approximation okay we inject this in s this is what we obtain and we can rewrite this as follows so you should be able to see that if i look at the difference equation i will have yk plus one is equal to one minus ats y of k plus ats x of k right so here there is no direct feed through the pole is located in one minus ATS again exponential of x is approximately 1 plus x when x is small so this is approximately the exponential of minus ATS the continuous pole is minus a and you can see that when TS is small the continuous and discrete time poles are linked by the relation z is the exponential of tss but this is only the case when ts is small here because we use a numerical integration method remember that this method has to be used with care because of what we have said previously a stable system could be discretized and could become unstable after discretization normally there should not be a problem if ts is chosen sufficiently small but the problem of course is well this sufficiently small the next numerical integration method is the trapezoidal method we use again the same equation so y of k is the output of the integrator at sample k is the integrator or the output of the integrator at the previous sample plus a correction okay and this correction will approximate the area under the curve that i'm 
showing you right now. So it's this area over here. And as you can see, this area in blue can be approximated by the area of a trapezoid that is shown here in gray. The area of the trapezoid is the same as the area of a rectangle with base TS and with height, the average of XK minus one and XK. So this explains the term that has been added here. It's the approximation of the area shown in blue, right? So again, we go to the Z domain. So these two terms remain the same. So we have TS over two, Z minus one plus one x of z if you rewrite this okay in terms of y z this is what you obtain so this is the transfer function of my discrete integrator in terms of the variable z minus one if you multiply numerator and denominator by z this is what you obtain so this is the discrete time integrator that has been obtained using the trapezoidal numerical approximation method. So we have obtained an approximation of the continuous time integrator using this trapezoidal method and the discrete time integrator is this one. So what we'll do is equate those two equations and this will yield a formula that you can use to obtain a discrete time description of a transfer function using this trapezoidal method so it's really an approximation of the relation between the z variable and the s variable so you take your transfer function h of s you replace it by this expression here and you have a numerical approximation of the transfer function a transfer function in z according to this trapezoidal method so you can also write the relation by inverse mapping so here it's s as a function of z you can also express z as a function of s so we'll have ts over 2 s times z plus 1 is equal to z minus 1 we take everything that is in z on one side so it's z ts over 2 s minus 1 is equal to minus 1 minus ts over 2 right and this will yield this relation over here so for the 10,000th time we use this approximation of the exponential when x is small so this is the exponential here on the numerator of approximately the exponential of ts over 2s at the denominator we have the exponential of minus ts over 2s so indeed this relation over here is approximating the actual relation between z and s so this is the approximation of the actual relation between the S and Z domain. The actual relation is this one. This one will approximate it, right? And it corresponds to the trapezoidal method for approximation and the trapezoidal numerical integration method. And we will show next that this relation here this mapping maps the j omega axis so this axis over here onto the unit circle right and what is nice is that well this region to the left of the j omega axis is mapped inside the unit circle and this region to the right of the j omega axis is mapped outside the unit circle so a system that is stable in the s domain will be stable in the z domain 
okay and all systems that are unstable in the laplace domain will remain unstable in the z domain if you use this trapezoidal method so this is kind of an improvement of what we had obtained with the euler integration methods so this inverse mapping well, maps kind of the whole left off plane inside the unit circle as we have seen that the actual relation z is equal to the exponential of tss maps the left of the j omega axis to what is inside the unit circle but it does this in strips of width 2 pi over ts so this is an s over here minus j p t s and this is a strip of width 2 pi over t s this is the sampling frequency so there is still a distortion that crushes the whole j omega axis on the unit circle it can be corrected at one and one frequency only and this will lead to this fourth integration rule I will present it but this will be for your information only what we have over here is the approximate relation between Z and S if we use the trapezoidal approximation and we want to see if well the j omega axis is mapped onto the unit circle so what we do is inject s is j omega in here this is what we have over here and we multiply by the complex conjugate of the denominator and you obtain this expression so the denominator will be a real huh, because it's a an expression times its complex conjugate so indeed this is what we observe and we can compute the square over here this is what you obtain so you can rewrite z as the real part of z and the imaginary part of z the real part of z is given over here the imaginary part of z is given over here so we have to check if the real part of z squared plus the imaginary part of z squared is equal to one okay if this is the case well the j omega axis will be mapped on a circle centered in zero of radius one okay so what we do here is take the square of this one take the square of this one the denominator is the same so we put everything under the de same denominator so we take the square of this one this is what you see over here and this is the square of the numerator of the real part and then we take the well square of the numerator of the imaginary part and you've got it over here right and then you can observe that of course you have a one so you can put a four over here and a four over here so that this one cancels right and this one becomes a plus two right so this is what you got over here but this is the same square as you have in the denominator so indeed this is equal to one so we can apply the trapezoidal method to the system we have been considering so far a first order system with a dc gain of one a static gain of one so we use the trapezoidal approximation so we have to inject this expression over here in here we'll replace s by this expression do the calculations and this is the transfer function that you get and the resulting transfer function after reorganization is this one you can see here that this is the discrete pole the continuous pole is minus a so we can see that there are, if you take this one and this one the relation z is exponential of ts is not valid but if ts is small we can again use this approximation of the exponential one plus x if x is small so this will be 
exponential of minus ATS over 2. This will be the exponential of ATS over 2. So this discrete pole can be approximated by this quantity if TS is small. So if TS is small, again, well, you see that this relation over here okay will approximate or the inverse relation will approximate the relation z is equal to tss and when ts is small you can see that the continuous time pole is indeed very well approximated using this relation over here well you should be able to use this discrete time transfer function and obtain the input output relation so y of z divided by x of z so we have that 1 plus a t s over 2 z y of z minus 1 minus a t s over 2 y z is equal to a t s over 2 z x of z plus x of z and again times a t s over 2 right so y c y of z is equal to take this one to the other side we have 1 minus a t s over 2 divided by 1 plus a t s over 2 y of z plus a t s over 2 divided by 1 plus a t s over 2 times z x z plus x z right so what we can now do is use the inverse z transform and we have y k plus 1 is equal to 1 minus a t s over 2 over 1 plus a t s over 2 y of k plus a t s over 2 over 1 plus a t s over 2 times x k plus 1 plus x of k so this is the different equation that results from this transfer function so let us consider this fourth method trapezoidal method with pre-warping so we start with the original trapezoidal method and the relation between s and z is as follows we inject in here this relation the actual relation and we evaluate on the j omega axis so if you do this this is what you obtain and what is done here is to multiply numerator and denominator by exponential of minus j omega t s over 2 and this is what you obtain this one over here is 2 j sine of omega t s over 2 right and here you have 2 cosine omega t s over 2 so what you'll have is this expression of your sine over cosine is a tangent and the j comes from over here the two will cancel out of course right so this is omega t s so this is the discrete frequency as you can see here we have s but that should be j omega so we have a relation here between the analog frequency and the discrete frequency the if you take these two relations the j will cancel out and this is what you have you can reverse this relation and this is what you obtain so if omega t s is small this will be approximately omega t s over 2 because 
the arc tangent of x is x minus x cube over 3 plus x5 over 5 minus x7 over 7 and so on so if omega ts is small what you will have here is that this will approximately be omega ts over 2 so we'll have approximately that the discrete frequency is indeed omega ts right but if ts becomes larger or the frequency becomes larger okay so further on in the discrete border diagram omega ts will become larger and you will see that of course you have a distortion in conclusion if you use the well classical trapezoidal method you have this relation between the analog frequency and the discrete frequency this introduces a distortion you can see that everything is exact when omega is equal to zero okay so you have the expected relation and this is the relation that you expect you have it only for omega is equal to zero and you see that you have it approximately for omega ts small but if the well this quantity becomes larger well you have really a distortion so using this trapezoidal method you'll have well no distortion only at one frequency so the idea is to use a transformation that eliminates the scale distortion at a specific frequency omega one with the classical trapezoidal method omega one is equal to zero but here we want it for a given uh, frequency omega one and we'll modify the relation to this relation over here so with the classical trapezoidal method we have s is equal to 2 over ts z minus 1 over z plus 1 so we replace it by this quantity over here and this will make sure that there is no distortion at a frequency omega 1 that can be a general frequency that you select again see that if ts is small this tangent okay with ts small the tangent can be replaced by omega 1 ts over 2 and then you recover this formula over here well let us apply this to our usual transfer function first order with static gain one we use this trapezoidal approximation with pre-warping okay and the idea is that we do not want a distortion at the frequency omega one so we inject this expression of s in the transfer function this is what you obtain so what we'll consider is evaluate this transfer function on the j omega axis and evaluate this one on the unit circle right remember z is e of t s s so if we evaluate this on the j omega axis we inject here j omega and this is similar to evaluated on the unit circle okay so this is what we do we replace z by this quantity this is what you obtain here in this relation we multiply numerator and denominator by exponential of minus j omega ts over 2 we have done this trick before this is what you obtain here on the numerator this is 2j sine omega ts over 2 right what you've got over here is a 2 cosine omega ts over 2 so the twos will cancel out the j will remain so you'll have here j tangent omega ts over 2 so this is indeed what you've got and if you look at this now at the frequency omega is equal 
to omega 1 this will become a over j omega 1 plus a and this is precisely h of j omega 1 so by this trapezoidal approximation you have made sure that there is no distortion in your discrete time approximation at a given frequency that is omega 1 over here this can also be illustrated in MATLAB we use the system h of s is equal to 10 over s plus 10 the sampling period is 0.05 seconds and we use the trapezoidal method with pre-warping and the pre-warping frequency is chosen as well 30 radians per second and we use the command C to D with the argument pre-warp and then you have to add an additional argument with the pre-warping frequency and then we can compare the body diagram of the original continuous time system and the well, body diagram of the approximated discrete time system and you can see that indeed they coincide at the frequency 30 radians per second i will now show you how you can use this theory to implement a block in this case here a first order system in a processor or a plc well, this slide comes from next year's course of practical process control. And what is done here is find the Euler backward difference discrete equivalent of a first order system. Remember that the first order system has this transfer function here. This is the gain and this is the time constant. We apply the Euler backward difference approximation. This means that we replace S by this relation of z and ts if you inject that into the transfer function you obtain the discrete time equivalent description of the system if you write k as ts over t you can rewrite this you will see that this is not very complicated and then if you do the inverse z transform you can rewrite this as a discrete time relation that you can implement in your plc and i will show you this right now i will show you now how you can use this recursive equation to program a function block or fb in the pcs7 environment of scenes the type of code that we will obtain would be very similar using another environment from another vendor here we will use plc sim to emulate a plc well this is the semantic manager and in the semantic manager well you see that there are containers for the sources and these can be used to program fbs for instance and here you see all the blocks and for instance here you see the fbs and these fbs can then be used to write a program in the form of a well control function chart so let's have a look at that you see you have blocks that are linked with one another I have prepared the code for this first order filter. Its name is FO for first order filter. Here are the inputs. The first input is a Boolean input that allows you to enable and disable the block. Then you have, of course, the parameters of the first order system, the gain, the time constant, the lag time constant, the sampling time have added a mode so you can choose the algorithm either Euler backward difference or Euler forward difference and of course here the input of the first order filter that is going to be filtered so you can see over here the output and this is the output the filtered input if you like this is here a constant that will be used but that is not kept into memory this is 
going to be this ts over t that you saw in the slide and what you see over here are variables that are kept into memory this is the previous input and this is the previous output this init variable we'll discuss later but this previous input and previous output are necessary because we implement a recursive equation and the output for instance is computed as a function of the previous output so this previous output you need to keep it into memory the actual code is in between begin and end function block if the time constant is positive well the two recurrence equations are implemented and well according to the mode you select either the first one or the second one k is this constant ts over t lag that we had in the slide what we have over here is the Euler backward difference implementation and here the Euler forward difference implementation and as you can see in the Euler backward difference imp implementation the output is constructed from the previous output of course and the actual input right so we are projecting back here the output is constructed from the previous output and from the previous input we are projecting forward right if the time constant is negative or the algorithm is not enabled we see that the output is initialized at input times gain at the end of the code previous input is set to input and previous output is set to output so that at the next iteration well the previous output and the previous input is available for the algorithm remember that previous input and previous output is kept in memory from one iteration to another the bit of code that you see over here is to make sure that the output is initialized at input times gain the first time that the algorithm is run so here in it is a variable that is kept in memory and that is initialized at one it's a boolean variable so that if you go through the code the first time as in it is one you go through the code and you set output to gain times input so that the output is initialized correctly and then you set in it to zero so that well you never enter this bit of code again in this fashion if you use your block and you're putting in it in a program and you compile and download in a algorithm that is running well you will not have the output of the filter that is initialized to zero because that would be problematic here you will have that the output will be initialized directly at a value that is well what you expect and then from there on the first order filter will start to function if it would have been initialized at zero it would take well roughly five times the time constant for the output to reach its working point well once the block is ready you have to assign an fb number to your function or your symbol fo once that is done you can compile the block and you can see here zero error zero warnings and then well this block becomes available here in the list i can over here we see it this is the block first order well once the block has been compiled it becomes available in cfc you find it over here fb7 first order filter i've brought it over here in the control function chart here i'm just going to test the block so there are no links that come from somewhere else or that go somewhere else so what i will do is compile my code i just added the block so i need only to compile changes and then i can download to my emulated p 
PLC. And then we can have a look and see what happens. And here you see that the input is 10 for the moment and the output is 10 as well. And we'll just make a change and see what happens on a curve. I have prepared a trend and in this trend we will see two curves. Well, the input of the first order filter and the output of the first order filter. So we can start the acquisition and go back to our block. You can see here that the time constant is 10 seconds, that the sampling period is 0.1 second. So this block runs in a cycle that runs every 0.1 second. The mode is one. Okay, so we use Euler backward difference. So let's make a change over here of 50% and let's go and have a look as you can see here in black we see the step change and in blue the response of the first order filter right time constant is 10 seconds so we expect that after roughly five times the time constant so 50 seconds we are at well steady state or more or less at the steady state. So this seems to be okay. So we have tested this block here in CFC and since it is found to be okay, we can use it in any program. What I will do now is do the same kind of exercise in MATLAB Simulink. So I will program a first order block discrete from scratch. You will have to do the same thing in the digital control laboratory where you have to work on the LTR 700 Airstream and temperature control plant and you'll have to implement a feed forward. Therefore you will need to implement a discrete time equivalent of a lead lag system and you will have to implement also a discrete PID controller. Later on in the course I will show you that this PID controller with feed forward on the LTR700 can be simulated also on the PCS7 system. Well, the first order block you find over here, it has an input and output and here this is the init function and you can initialize the output to this value over here if this one is one this block comes with a mask so if you double click this is what you see this is the sampling period the gain and the lag time constant what you can do in MATLAB Simulink is edit the mask and you go to parameters and dialog so you can if you click on here add inputs this is T lag here it's the same over here and here but the functionality of this one the first one is what appears over here and the functionality of this one is that underneath the mask the variable is known as T underscore lag the value is initialized in the mask at the value of 10 as you can see when I double click. If you click on the arrow over here you can have a look inside the mask and this is what you see. So here we have a MATLAB function. I will go into the details later on. Here we have the inputs and here you have the well parameters that are attached to the block using a source block constant parameter block. And you see that the names over here correspond with what you have entered in the mask. And here you have the output. So if you click over here, you return to the initial view. And I will show you now how you can construct a MATLAB function with a mask using a very simple example. So if you go to the library browser, you can find all the blocks that are at your disposal and what we need here is a MATLAB function so we drag and drop 
we double click and what we have inside is MATLAB code. So I'll make a very simple block. So what this function it does is simply add the two first inputs. What we'll do here is add K that will be changeable in the mask to U2 to construct Y. So Y will be U2 plus K and this K will be changeable in the mask. So what you do is select everything and first create a subsystem. All right. So we can of course give it a name. So add K for instance. You can go and have a look inside and call this for instance U and call this one Y. Okay, so U, Y, at K. And so what you need to do now is mask, create mask. And then you can go over here. And then here is what will appear in the mask. So I will call it, for instance, parameter K, right? And here K and let us assume that we want to initialize with 5 here if we apply this is what we have right so when we click now we have the parameter k5 that is going to be added to you okay so this is how you construct such a function over here and now i can delete it we'll have a look at what is under the mask again and we see that we have here the MATLAB function that implements the first order difference equation that we had seen on the slide. We had seen also in the PLC implementation that we had to make sure that this code is ran every TS and that there is a sample period of TS. Of course here in MATLAB we have also to impose the sample period and this is how you do it. You right click, you go to block parameters and you have the sample time over here. If this block comes from the library it will have a sample time of minus one which means that it is inherited from the blocks that are up front and the sample time could be well, that of a continuous time signal, which would be completely wrong. So you have to put here TS in our case, because this is the sample period that you will have set in your mask. So please do not forget that. And certainly not at the time of the exam. Well, now that you have set the sample period of this block, we can have a look inside and well what we have here is the Euler backward difference implementation so persistence here out out p stands for previous output out previous so this variable out p here is kept in memory okay this is again the variable k t s over t lag and out is constructed from the previous output and the input once out has been computed well you can construct well set out p and uh, previous output to out so that at the next iteration well the previous output is indeed available what you see over here is this initialization okay we had something similar in uh, the code uh, for the plc implementation and here we have something that is specific to the matlab simulink code well you have to assign a variable or a value at the first run so if this variable is empty what you do is you set the output to kp the gain times in and you have an ad another advantage is, for instance, if this in is a vector, by working this way, you have automatically set out previous and therefore also out to a vector of the same 
dimension okay so this function here for a first order will be actually a first order vector function well let us now go back and to the original block as i've said this block works as a first order and it accepts vector input so what we'll do here at the input is put a step and a ramp so the first input is a step the second one a ramp and then we have a sample period of 0 0.05 seconds a gain of one and a lag time constant of 10 and what we can then do is simulate the system so here it takes a bit of time because it has compiled everything here you see that it is in red it means that every signal here in red has a discrete sample time which is expected huh? because the output is indeed a discrete time signal so we can have a look indeed this is the response here to a step and this is the the first order type response to a step and this is the first order response to a ramp so what we can do is go and zoom and we can see indeed that the sample time is 0 0.05 seconds so this block seems to do what is expected from it well, in the S domain, processes with delay are well known to be difficult to control. They can be described by a transfer function when you have an additional factor exponential of minus theta S and where theta is the delay. And you will see in year, next year's course, practical process control, that if the delay becomes large with respect to the main time constants well the processes can be challenging to control and what is usually done is to use a smith predictor what is sometimes done is to approximate the delay using this first order but the approximation that we have introduced in the beginning of the course the idea is to replace this exponential by a rational transfer function but still the results are not that good very often as mentioned before in the z domain the discrete time case things become a lot easier so if you ensure that your delay in the system is a multiple of the sampling period and here the multiple is k0 well you can see because of this relation that links the z domain and the s domain that the exponential of minus theta s can be rewritten like this and this is simply coming from this relation over here and as you can see this is really z minus k0 so it's really using k0 well sample delays and this is a strong advantage in designing controllers in the discrete time case so in discrete time controller design delays can be handled as simple poles on the origin so you can rewrite this as 1 over z to the power k0 so indeed you have poles on the origin in your process when there is a delay